And now we go on to Martha. Uh, again, you know, it's somebody that was a, an absolute pleasure to be associated with for so many years. Martha and I go back to like 1974, I think. Um, and it was uh, great to have her as our fearless leader there for a while. So what, what was your vision when you, the first time you walked into that office? Well, well, thank you, and thank you for the invite, and it's amazing to see everybody. And I've only, I was unfortunately only able to come for the day, and I haven't gotten to any meetings because I just keep running into all these absolutely <laughs> wonderful people. And uh, just thank you for all um, your support and for the past directors. I mean, Larry passed on to me a very wonderful and strong NIDCR, and so I just did nothing. That was my vision. <laughs> <laughs> But no. it's really funny, you know, you almost predict that someone's going to ask you what's your vision because that's the first thing anybody asked. And so during um, the interview for the NIDCR position, I was just reflecting on this and it was an absurd vision that I had. Um, and maybe it will click with you, but it was very naive at the time. And what I thought I could do was enhance NIDCR's stature by transforming its reputation as a research powerhouse. Now, that's not what a director does. It's all of you that do this, so it was an incredibly uh, naive way of looking at it. And I was thinking about, unfortunately, I went back and uh, looked at one of the first grants that I was ever funded. And for those of you that have been in research, I advise you not to do that. <laughs> Because you say, how did anyone ever fund this absurdity? But then going back, we, um, and as with the group, and as Larry has mentioned, with an incredible group of staff, we re-envisioned that vision that I had about five years later when we were looking at a strategic plan. And what I realized is NIDCR is the catalyst. It's the catalyst for what you do and for all the people in this room and others around. Just thank you for the, all the activity. But so one is to enhance our research. But then the vision of how to do that and activate it, and a lot of it is common to what Larry was saying as well. So that we're well recognized in the research and the basic research has to stay there. But it needs to be bi-directional and um, transdisciplinary, both in the training grants and also in the research that we fund. And what I mean by bi-directional is that we um, often sit in our silos, do the research in our silos, and then there are clinicians out there, and the clinicians are going, what are you talking about? I don't care about that, that's not science. What I need is this and that we absolutely need to communicate with the clinicians. We need to be partners with the clinicians, practice-based research network. But then when you go back and look at the practice-based research network, it's still working beautifully for all of you that are involved. But what we haven't done is the bi-directional. When there is a gap, when we're not seeing the data in the PBRN, are we going back and asking the basic science questions that would be more important for the clinician, so that bi-directional activity is very important. And then for the transdisciplinary, and um, as Larry has said, and I think we've been much more successful, if you look at medical articles now, you'll actually see them saying, and the oral tissues were dry, or that they were okay. It, we're actually seeing that this year in many of the high quality uh, medical journals. But we're not there yet, and we need to do a better job. So the other part of that is advocacy. And you as, as uh, researchers and in practice of making sure you're getting your message out to others. And just one more story on that side in terms of the vision. I remember, um, similar to Larry, when I was at the University of Washington, we collectively, once, once a year we did a research day with the deans and we did it in the lobby because we were all together. And I remember um, a dad and uh, a daughter just walking by dentistry and saying, oh, that's not of interest to you because they don't do any research. And I remember gently grabbing them back and talking to them all about the research. Whether it made an impact or not, I don't know. But it made me realize communication, communication, and that's something that's so critical for all of us. So 
Thank you for the question that, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, there certainly was a, a lot there, and I know that you accomplished much of it, but what would you consider to be the biggest accomplishment that you made during that time? Yeah. So um, I have um, a few, but again, I mean, it's, it, it, it's so true. Um, we accomplish what we accomplish, it's not us. It's you, and it's also the incredible staff that are working 24-7 at NIDCR that make our job look really easy and that we're the visionary, but it's all of you that are. So the accomplishments, one of, one of them, so one of the ones, I'm not going to mention names because I, I'm afraid I'll thank somebody and not somebody else. But one of the things that I felt was one of my greatest accomplishments, again, because of all of you, was uh, related to the clinical center. And I was able to recruit um, so I felt that NIDCR needed more attention in the clinical arena. And I was very fortunate to recruit a very talented, insightful individual who was able to transform the way we taught our, our fellows and brought them in and make, made sure that they had a basic science component that when they finished the fellows program, they were well positioned to, some of them went on for PhDs, some are already had PhDs, but ended up with very, very strong positions. In a, and as evidence of that, she's not only the um, director of the NIDCR clinic, but also a deputy director because of her talents in that area and bringing back in rare disease and working with the extramural community with XO, XO1 grants and other things like that. The other area that I felt um, and I, I, felt, I felt a little uncomfortable in doing this is um, putting in a new model for regenerative medicine. And it's in my area of interest, but when I looked at what we were funding in our portfolio in um, the research arena, we were doing wonderful work at the basic science level in regeneration, but it was going nowhere. It was such wonderful work with no end. And um, put in a very unique model um, that we funded it in stages and that if you were successful at one stage, then you moved on. If you weren't successful, you moved elsewhere. And so um, I think that has worked and uh, we've seen patents related to that and moving into the clinical arena related to that area. Um, maybe w one more um, area is, and it's because of your accomplishments with the microbiome. And that's really an interesting thing because it was what I was told, Larry, and maybe it's not correct, is that one of the drivers, there were five sites that were selected. One was the oral cavity and three sites within the oral cavity, but it almost didn't get funded. And could you imagine what we would have lost if that wasn't funded? And I imagine you were probably a driver in making sure that that was funded. And with that, the advances both with the re research in our intramural program and extramural program, the microbiome has exploded with the gut, oral, brain axis and much more of bringing the mechanistic side into oral systemic versus just the associations. So I think it's just been amazing. And I can go on, it's not my accomplishments, it's because of everything all of you in this audience were during, during my tenure. So I thank you for your accomplishments. Thank you. I, I really particularly have appreciated your support of the regeneration aspect of uh, the work and, uh, you know, translating what we do in the, the lab and trying to get it into human practice, which Thank you. is really important. Yeah. So what was your Walter Cronkite moment? Yeah, so I'm not too sure if I have as many fun Walter Cronkites, but um, I think one was um, at the beginning and the other was at the end of my tenure. And it's... it's um, and I've already expressed this, but when I first, the first few month, weeks when I was at um, NIDCR, the intramural leadership and the extramural leadership, we sat around the table and we, uh, they presented proposals and research areas that, we that they were interested in. And then I looked at it and I said, well, here are the priorities that I think I have and the way I would position it. And I said, so what do we do now? And they said, well, we move on with those. And it was, such, I mean, it was such an unusual experience for me because coming from academia, you never make a decision. Every faculty person is me, 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 me. I'm sorry for those of you that are in academia. At NIDCR, at NIH, it's a, an a collective environment. 
So at the end of my tenure, um, and not being a party person, but they said, no, you have to go to this party and we have to celebrate you. And I said, oh no. And uh, it was amazing. I couldn't believe the commitment and they even sent me off with a video, um, a very funny, funny video, and also the leadership of your presentations and of all the colleagues all around NIH. And it made a huge d difference to me. And so it's NIH, NIDCR, it's our staff, our, it's our environment, it's all the research that's going on inside and outside, and that was memorable. Well, wonderful experience for me of how great um, the experience was. It's a great place to work, so I thank you and your dedication and all of you. Yes, that was quite a gathering, and I think in our slide deck we actually have a picture of uh, Francis and uh, you and Suzanne, our, your trusty assistant, and you looked very happy.